Okay, in this third part and hopefully final part, I'm going to talk about uh, where the what the courts have done with the Endangered Species Act and and where we seem to be going from here. So on the slide, we see a spotted owl on the left and a and a lumber mill worker on the right, and um, the courts were asked really to weigh. Uh, endangered species versus people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and there were a lot of acrimonious court battles over whether the bird on the left was actually endangered and actually needed these trees, and what kinds of forests did it need. Um, you know, in retrospect, uh, this poor guy over on the right, he was um, uh, a guy who was going to be losing his job anyway, as the mills were uh, not very profitable, but nonetheless. Um, there was a lot of uh, fighting over this uh, that has mostly ceased uh, and it seems to have ceased uh, for at least two or three reasons. One being um, that not as many lawsuits are being brought against the agencies for um, to try and argue that they um, have capriciously listed a species that is not actually endangered or the science isn't robust in terms of its endangerment and its habitat needs. Um, the second one is that the agencies are being much more careful about trying to work with people uh, and uh, reduce that um, acrimony over issues. So, um, uh, and you can see that in a lot of decisions that they've they've made recently. So, um, <clears throat> so what's happened in the courts? The the exact meaning of the ESA has been solidified. That courts interpreted harm to mean include. Uh, habitat degradation that courts have uh, mandated recovery plans in critical habitats and uh, courts have viewed the ESA as a clear ethical directive to accept sacrifice on behalf of the important goal of protecting species. Uh, cost is not uh, mentioned in the Endangered Species Act that uh, something being painful to protect doesn't mean it shouldn't be protected. Uh, and the courts have generally forced the Fish and Wildlife Service to be uh, more protective. But this has brought up this issue of does the ESA work? Uh, should we continue to list species? Uh, when would we be done? What about delisting? Things go on but never come off. Uh, do the programs provide enough support? Well, the um, argument has, has been that uh, an awful lot of these 1,400 or so endangered species would have gone extinct had they not had some protection. That, in fact, the few things that have gone extinct on the list um, uh, that many of them went extinct actually before they got put on the list. Uh, this list differs from the Center for Biological Diversity because what the agency and what the Center for Biological Diversity are willing to call extinct are, are two different things. Um, recovered species outnumber um, species that have, have gone extinct. So we're batting more than five, five, 500 on these sorts of issues. Um, However, uh, you know, looking at the Nature Serve looked at the distribution of uh, occurrences of endangered species and found um, that in these imperiled and listed species, just a huge uh, fraction of their occurrences are on uh, private property. And so this is where uh, the challenge with the Endangered Species Act has occurred that trying to um, protect species uh, when we don't own, the, uh, the public doesn't own the land. And this has uh, signaled then a, sh a shift, a uh, very nice poster here, uh, working together, partnerships for endangered species recovery. This was really the uh, marching orders of the George W. Bush administration and, and, and Gail Norton as Secretary of the Interior, and it has um, uh, been so since then, uh, that we're going to try and um, uh, employ uh, alternative st strategies, um, habitat conservation plans, gives more authority to local governing agencies um, to uh, issue permits when there is a agreed upon plan for mitigating damage to endangered species. Uh, safe Harbor um, uh, is the provision that says if you create better habitat for endangered species, uh, you won't be, the bar won't be raised on you and you won't be uh, held accountable for a higher standard. Uh, and that these are written agreements. No surprises is that once the Fish and Wildlife Service enters into an arrangement um, that it, they, they can change their mind but they'll be paying full market value and won't, won't ask for more sacrifice from the private landowners if they do change their mind. They're also shifting allocation of protection funds and doing more things uh, along the lines of candidate uh, conservation, cooperative candidate conservation planning, trying to do some proactive planning of things that are actually already 
the fully endangered, but um, putting in protection so as to not list them. Okay, so let's go through these uh, a little bit individually. Um, Section 10 uh, permits uh, uh, habitat conservation plans if private developers or landowners uh, provide a plan to account for long-term protection then the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will issue Section 10 permits for a development plan. And to go one step further, uh, when county governments are involved in a, in a link it to a county planning uh, tool, um, such, like, such as a long-range uh, county plan, uh, the county can actually, they can give a permitting authority to the county so that the uh, county is issuing the permits. You don't have to go back to Fish and Wildlife Service every time. Uh, these things have been uh, uh, distributed uh, differentially. So uh, th this is from Kurt Flather again. Uh, so um, here are uh, a, a, a map of counties with uh, um, HCPs covering uh, five or more species. And you see it's something that's, that's been uh, well exercised in the state of Washington, California, uh, Arizona, and Texas, and not much other places. Uh, cooperative conservation planning, um, candidate conservation planning has been used a lot in the southeast. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of smaller uh, habitat conservation plans where individual landowners have partition, uh, per, uh, petitioned for and received uh, a habitat conservation plan authority. As I mentioned, Safe Harbor facilitates good stewardship by limiting the threat of future regulation on enhanced uh, habitat. Um, so if you increase protection, um, you're not going to be held accountable for that higher standard. And there's lots of safe harbor, and there's a information on how to enter into a safe harbor uh, agreement. Uh, frankly, as my understanding, not very many of them have been in entered into. Similarly, uh, no surprises, once the Fish and Wildlife Service strikes a deal, they agree to not change the rules, and this adds uh, financial certainty. One of the things that was um, apparently uh, one of the biggest uh, incentives for business to come to the table from the Southern California MSRP and uh, down there was uh, that uh, developers didn't mind that it cost a lot to build on private land, that they paid a fee for endangered species, they just wanted certainty of how much it would cost so that they could budget this into their development plans. Uh, and so that there's also uh, web materials to figure out how you uh, sign up for no surprises. And that uh, there's all these uh, shifting allocation of protection of funds. So CalFed, uh, Bay Delta program is an example of trying to mitigate further losses and try and prevent things from getting on the, on the list um, uh, through time. And of course, then the Secretary of Interior is, uh, is an incredibly Im important uh, person uh, in terms of making these decisions. And you have uh, Bruce Babbitt and Gail Norton uh, being uh, people who were <laughs> um, uh, had you know, famous uh, terms as uh, secretaries of interior. Um, but if you look at the number of people who were, were permanently appointed people, uh, Bruce Babbitt was the governor of Arizona. Uh, uh, Gail Norton was attorney general of Colorado. Uh, Dirk Kempthorne was the governor of Idaho. Uh, these were all Western states, and they're all politicians. Uh, and that this has been a, a pattern. Um, it's, uh, Ken Salazar on, is a senator from uh, Colorado. And so this interesting thing, I think, to look at in terms of the next few years is these have all been politicians. They've all been politicians from Western states. They've all been politicians with successful careers who then step in and deal with the interior. And this is dealing with the interior on a whole lot of issues, not just endangered species, but also Bureau of Indian Affairs and all the public lands management in the West. And uh, who's next? Uh, Sally Jewell, commercial banker and, and CEO of REI. And so uh, a really different sort of person is now the Secretary of Interior. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how that manifests over the next um, um, several years. So anyway, that's uh, uh, the lecture on the Endangered Species Act. Um, it's my understanding uh, that there may be a move to introduce legislation in this legislative session to uh, on the Endangered Species Act, something that hasn't been done in several years now and hasn't been done since um, those threats to the Endangered Species Act by Richard Pombo and others uh, trying to uh, force the federal government into paying for all imposition on private landowners. 
Uh, okay, and so that's the end of the third YouTube, and hopefully we'll talk during the discussion hour. Thanks.